day. Um, and Tom and I have been colleagues for a number of years and um, kind of reached out and learned what he was doing. And I said, let's do a web discussion to share because there's, you know, amazing learnings that you're having. And I bet all of you have amazing learnings as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. And Tom Llewellyn is the Strategic Part Partnerships Director at Shareable.net. And he's a lifelong sharer, commoner, and a storyteller. And he's pretty amazing. Um, and I'm excited to, to hear from him. So with that, actually, I think I did have one more slide, Tom, just to show if you were to um, search on the page, there's actually a couple of examples of mutual aid networks that are available um, there as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Well, thanks, Sue. Um, great to be here and, and to be able to kind of talk about some of the work that we've been doing uh, specifically over the last few months at Shareable. Um, and so, as was mentioned, my name is Tom Llewellyn. I'm with, with Shareable.net, um, wear a number of hats there, uh, here, there. And uh, one of the, the projects that we've been working on uh, for the last few months really um, was to cover this incredible groundswell of activities that have been happening all over the world um, kind of in the face of the pandemic to uh, reduce the harm of it uh, for others in their community and for people to be able to find connection, uh, social connection and, and to maintain not only physical health but also mental health, uh, finding an outlet uh, for how to kind of process everything that was going on. And so uh, the way that we kind of did our work at Shareable um, was to help with the storytelling to collect examples of, of how these things were happening and, and then also to support others to replicate them. And at the same time as we were kind of covering all this stuff during the day and trying to spread on the, you know, on, on the state or national and global level, uh, these different examples uh, during the, the evenings and weekends, most of our staff was, was activated and working in our own communities. And so we were able to draw upon our own knowledge and, and a lot of our coverage that we've been doing for the last uh, nine months has really become has really come from the come out of the the work that we were doing as individuals um, in addition to kind of being media makers and, and covers and and so that's what we've done now is we've gone back we've looked at uh, you know the last probably about 50 different stories that we've been able to cover we pulled together some of the top ones that we felt were um, the kind of the easiest to, to replicate or, or showed kind of a, a diverse picture of really what was going on. And, and we felt like this was incredibly important to, to pull these resources together uh, because we are now facing another wave. You know, as we're seeing the cases are on the rise uh, everywhere across the United States, globally as well, places are going back into shutdown. Uh, you know, we, we kind of had a, a little bit of a, of a respite uh, as we were going in, changing of the seasons. Uh, and, and now we're, we're kind of getting a little bit of, of the comeuppance from being a little bit too lax, it seems like. And so uh, there's gonna be a lot of people who were having a hard time. There may, may be those of you who are on the, the call today were having a hard time, um, but there's a lot of people that are gonna need extra support. And so what we've presented here are examples of, of things that you can start doing in your community right now. Um, or that you can start to build towards and, and to kind of expand upon uh, existing networks and, and products that have been successful to kind of implement new ideas and then grow from there. So that's what we'll be talking about today. And that's also what we cover in the book. And just to back up a little bit, um, you know, this is a great image, you know, we, we think about when a, what, it, what it means to respond to disasters, um, what it means to come together as a community. And, uh, you know, the idea of, of holding back, you know, building up the levees, holding back the water, you know, the, the, uh, the impending floods um, together with, with sandbags is, is a kind of an, imp it's, it's a uh, iconic image of that. And this is the, the type of experience that, you know, personally, I've had my entire life. I was fortunate to grow up in a small village of about 200 people. And uh, while it's kind of more of an unintentional community, if you will, uh, it was one of the things where, you know, my, I had these great experiences as a child 
uh, when things would go wrong. And it, and it kind of feels strange to, to think about it that way. But when there was a flood, when there was a fire, you know, when a bridge washed out, when, you know, there was some sort of a thing that brought the community together and enabled everyone to kind of let go of whatever they were holding, that's where um, I, I got a sense of joy. And you could tell that other people had that as well. Uh, and so one of the things that, that has really propelled me uh, in life is trying to figure out now, how do we um, come together in times where there isn't a disaster? How do we take those lessons and implement them and, and find those opportunities to collaborate with others and to break down those barriers that would otherwise be up uh, you know, when there isn't a time of crisis? And the best, the best way I know to do that is to kind of explore the mechanisms that, that create those those opportunities within the crisis and then try and grow those out. And so at Shareable for the last uh, 11 years, we've been collecting these stories of the ways that people are sharing, you know, in times of crisis and, and not. Um, and so far we've collected over 4,000 stories from around the world. Um, you know, we produce new stories every single week on shareable.net and, and we have our, our uh, free newsletter. And so you can get them straight into your inbox if you like. Um, and at the same time, we're all, as I was mentioning before, you know, we are all practitioners and we are constantly looking for ways to turn these ideas into um, kind of practical steps that people can take to be able to replicate them. And as a result, we've published over 300 how-to guides to date as well um, to help support folks, uh, including ones that we have put now in, in our new book. And so for the last couple of years, now we've, we've kind of looked at not only the ways that people can share, but also how those, those, those opportunities come up during disasters. Um, and it could be like the pandemic or fires and floods and earthquakes and everything. And so for, we've now been uh, doing a podcast, we've got a book and a, and a documentary film that is exploring just these things. And, and so I, I um, would suggest that people can kind of check out uh, our, our project on, on shareable.net and you can see the response and, and kind of get to, to learn a little bit more about the ways that, are, that people are coming together during these crises. And it was from doing this for the last two or three years that we really positioned ourselves to be able to go deeper into the examples from the pandemic um, because we were already looking at things that were not just kind of what we would think of as environmental disasters, but also social disasters. And one of the kind of the key points, as I was mentioning before, from my own experience that we've seen is that disasters really do bring people together. And, you know, that brings people the best and it kind of comes out from, from people. And we've seen that now during the pandemic in a, in a really big way. And so, as I mentioned before, we've now pulled these uh, many different examples. There's about 25 case studies and how-to guides and and interviews that we've pulled into this book. Um, if you registered for this event, you should have gotten a link to download it, but we'll also put a link in the chat. And I'm just going to kind of go through and, and talk about a few different examples now that I think are um, really kind of emblematic um, of the, uh, of the, that really stand out to me from the book. And so the, the first one that I just wanted to talk about really is the idea of creating a mutual aid network. And this is something that a lot of smaller projects can build towards, but it kind of shows um, the kind of overall picture of how a lot of the different examples I'm going to talk about in a moment uh, really kind of come together and, and interlock with each other. And um, there are now mutual aid centers all over the world. Um, you know, different networks have come together. Some of them have physical spaces. We made a whole documentary film uh, specifically about Puerto Rico and the mutual aid centers that came to get came up after Hurricane Maria that are still going and, and serving their communities now. Um, you know, during the pandemic, they were uh, amazing kind of organizing spaces, not only just for distributing food and, and needed supplies when when uh, supply lines uh, went down, but also as a place to organize and uh, politically and pushing for support, because once again, Puerto Rico was really had a, an inadequate response to the, the pandemic from our United States federal government. And another really great example, and this is what this image is, is actually representing, is actually from Chico, California. And 
in Chico is a is an interesting uh, example because there was already so many people that were houseless um, that needed support before the pandemic uh, because of the fire in paradise uh, next door, it, you know, the t one, two towns over a couple of years ago. And so they already had um, a lot of need in the community. And as a result, there was a lot of organizations that were already working and, and had relationships with people um, in and around Chico that, that needed extra support beforehand. And one of those examples and that we kind of really focused in on, and we ended up producing a 30 minute audio documentary about their work uh, is the, the Chico chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. And they had an existing mutual aid network that was going out, working with people that were houseless, working with people that were in public housing um, and that were kind of working on a very horizontal level. And when we talk about mutual aid, really what we're, what we're thinking about is is not just, um, we, we call it solidarity, not charity. And so the idea is that you see yourself um, in the, the, the people that you're working with and that you recognize that you're being fed um, you know, emotionally, spiritually, socially by those people that you're supporting as well. And it's a reciprocal re relationship. It, there's, there's no hierarchy to, to the support. And and so, you know, whilst they were going out, you know, and, and working with people and getting, bringing food, they were also, you know, supporting, making connections. They were uh, finding out information, being able to improve their services um, and build, build incredible relationships. And time and time again, um, we've been able to collect stories of people that, that have had those experiences um, and that oftentimes there, there can be a cycling through where, you know, people that are, that are part of a mutual aid network are offering support and then, you know, the next week they're looking for it and vice versa, you know, people that were potentially getting support to begin with then come back and are, are participating in the network and supporting others as well. And, and so within the book, we have two different uh, how-to guides um, around creating a mutual aid network. And the first one kind of just walks like a step-by-step -step process of what it takes to kind of come together with, with friends or neighbors to be able to initiate it, um, kind of how to do the design, how to program out the services, um, and to do it safely during, during the pandemic. And then beyond that, we kind of take it one step further. And we worked with a really great organization in uh, St. Louis, um, Solidarity St. Louis, that they've been around for, for many years. They've been one of our partners for a long time. And they've created an incredible guide for creating a mutual aid fund. And so, you know, if you want to figure out a way to distribute just money to people in your community and you want to do it in a uh, kind of very open and clear way with um, kind of a, an efficient way to, um, to take in need, to have people um, say, you know, what their needs are for and, and how much and how, and how and how much it's going to cost to be able to cover those, um, to be able to attract donors, to be able to then feed that as well. And they just created created a really, really wonderful system. And so we've taken, um, you know, we worked with them over a couple of months to uh, pull their um, learnings from the, the first few months of the of the pandemic um, to be able to put it into that how to guide. And so those are two, two really good kind of resources if you're, if you're looking to be able to create kind of a larger project. Um, but then from there, you know, it's, it's, you don't have to go all the way. There's, there's so many different uh, ways to get involved and to start supporting others and start improving both mental and physical health. And a, a great uh, kind of uh, institutional side that we've seen is really coming from libraries. And public libraries are already, um, you know, an incredible community center in, in many places. Um, that's where people are coming um, to not just get books, but to access the internet uh, to, you know, there's a, now this being this big rise of libraries of things where libraries are not just checking out books, but uh, checking out camping supplies and, and tools and media, um, you know, so cooking supplies, so many things. Um, and so it's kind of democratizing access and reducing waste to be able to provide those services. But also librarians are, are social workers. They're on the, the front lines of, of kind of our larger social disaster as we're seeing you know, some of the 
really incredible, you know, big negative effects of our capitalistic system, which really pushed a lot of people out. Um, libraries is, is some place that, that everyone can go to. It is a, it is a pan, no matter your kind of economic status, um, you can go to the library and, and people have strong connections to it. And so libraries are, are health facilities. Libraries are places where people are already getting connected to, um, to you know, other different resources and mental health ser services and, and so much, so many other things. And so once the pandemic started and libraries had to shut their doors um, during the shutdowns, many, many, many libraries all over the country shifted to start providing other services, uh, to being places to distribute food, um, to be distributing um, you know, PPEs, uh, to be coming uh, resource hubs to then connect people to available resources in the community to be able to aid, you know, with financially or, or for health resources or food or other things beyond what they were able to provide themselves. And what it's really done, I think, is provided a, a wonderful opportunities, uh, an opportunity for libraries to continue to reinvent themselves. And that's one of the things we've been seeing uh, for the last many years, you know, as there's a larger shift to, to digital and to the internet and, and far less people are checking out books. Libraries have still stayed incredibly relevant. And I think this is going to be continuing to push libraries in that direction. Again, I know here in the Bay Area, there's already a compact between about 25 libraries that share disaster response equipment. Um, so if a library is to suffer uh, some sort of a disaster to be flooded or anything else like that, there is um, kind of banks of materials which are being which are uh, available to be accessed by them, um, and so now we're just seeing this as another um, kind of extension of the way that libraries are 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 stepping up to be able to support their communities in many different ways. Another uh, you know kind of great example is is uh, of just things that that we're seeing during the pandemic. You know, often small things. You know, really are the ways that that. Uh, people are finding ways to combat loneliness and support mental health during the, the, during the shutdown. And, you know, some of these things have been, uh, you know, people coming out at a certain time in the evening and all howling and making noise and, and just finding that connection. Um, you know, this is something that was happening in, in Chico, you know, every single night and, and we included in our audio documentary, as I mentioned before. Uh, this is something that's happened in my community and, and where I live, you know, people blow conch shells and, and you know, make noise in, in different ways and, and find ways to make those connections. But also it's, it's just by reaching out to each other. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen is, is just so many different informal initiatives that, that people are taking on, uh, you know, and maybe it's door knocking, you know, and then stepping back at a distance and, and checking up on, on neighbors to see if they need anything. Uh, you know, posting stuff on on Nextdoor and 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 uh, other kind of Facebook groups and things like that. Um, and then also a number of people have been creating, uh, you know, little little templated um, uh, sheets saying, you know, like, do you need anything or, you know, here and putting them out saying so people can write down, oh, I need this sort of thing and just put it in the window and then other people can come and bring it to their doors. Um, you know, very simple, low tech um, but what we've seen is that this is, you know, connected neighbors in, in ways that have never been connected before. Um, you know, people are building relationships. It's uh, even though a lot of it's been happening online, it's been seeding uh, relationships that I think that are coming out of the pandemic. People are going to really want to connect to those people they've been working with on, on, you know, on the Internet. And we've seen that over the summer to a certain extent. Uh, you know, when things let up, people came out, people started to meet the, the other, other people, other neighbors that they've been connecting with and. You know, there's a lots of evening strolls that people are going on where, you know, every every evening, you know, five, six o'clock, people will go in, and walk out, at, you know, around and just see each other on the side of the on, on you know, the side and, and again, physically distant. Uh, but so there's there's those sorts of things. But one of the things that, that I have really found just for myself is how stepping up and supporting others in my community has improved my own mental health that it's given me a sense of purpose, um, you know, in, on the day to day and has helped to reduce my own anxiety around the pandemic and, 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 um, and really the additional crises that we've had here in California over the summer to be able to go and, and support others, 
to know that I was making some sort of a dif dif uh, difference in other people's lives. And uh, again, like I, like I said, is to, to have a sense of purpose, um, you know, to not just be sitting idly by and, and watching shows. And, and sometimes I do. And, and sometimes, you know, we need to just turn, turn off. And, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I watched, you know, probably 100 hours of, of television, maybe more than that. Um, and but then at a certain point in time, like that doesn't doesn't feed you anymore. And so then it's finding a, a way to, to to be able to feed oneself moving forward. And one of the um, the really striking um, uh, figures that's come up from our research over the years with the response, and there's been a number of studies that have that have shown this, is that it's the number and depth of our relationships that really is the greatest determinant for for resilience. Uh, you know, more so than having a go bag, than, um, you know, having a bunch of food and water and everything else stored at home. It's it's our relationships that really are the most important thing. And, you know, there's a great example of this from the 1995 Chicago fire, which found that, you know, all things being equal, that people were more likely to survive, not, excuse me, not the, the fire, the, the Chicago heat wave, um, that people were more likely to survive the heat wave um, if they had, d depending on the amount of relationships they had, um, people, it would, because people would come, they check on their neighbors, you know, they'd come to see if the family member is okay. And otherwise people were, were dying inside of their homes, inside of their apartments because of the heat wave. Uh, another example of this was in uh, Japan uh, during the triple disaster in 2011 of the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown. Uh, once again, it was the a number of and depth of relationships which determined whether or not someone was able to uh, evacuate in time before the tsunami came. And so, what we're seeing now is that people are really starting to realize that. You know, we've we've gone. You know, in in the United States in the 80s, I believe there was um, people had an average of three close friends, uh, and now uh, the the same study was was done just a couple of years ago that found that we now have an average of only one close friend. And if you think of that we have an average of only one close friend, that means that there's a huge number of people that don't have anyone that they have a close relationship that, with, that they feel like they could rely upon, that they could call when they needed some support. Um, and this pandemic is really exposing um, the, the negative impacts of that. You know, people are suffering. Um, and at the same time, people are realizing what they were missing before, um, you know, when all their when all of our kind of day to day distractions uh, fall fall apart, you see what you're left with, and so this has been uh, kind of an incredible driver uh, for people to realize, you know, start to make try to make connections and and to start reprioritizing their friends and family, and kind of rediving in those convers you know those those conversations build out their friendships. And, and so I think that's also a really positive thing that's come up. Um, and that's something that we're going to want to carry forward, you know, coming out of that as well. And I think, you know, we want to make sure we have some, some time for the kind of discussion as well. Um, and so I just want to touch on just a couple more things. But, um, you know, one of the things that, that has really been, that I've been really sitting with is how, um, how much the pandemic really mirrors uh, climate change in how, you know, the, but instead of being on a kind of time scale of decades, you know, the, the pandemic has been on a time scale of, of weeks and months. Uh, and so there was, you know, as, as we saw in the first, you know, few weeks and month, there was the, the people that were like, oh, this thing is happening. We need to take action. We need to get, we need to get moving. Um, and then there was also a whole subset of people of like, oh, this is just an overblown thing. You know, the pandemic really isn't real, um, you know, or it's, it's going to happen, but it's not going to be that bad. And so there's nothing really that we should do. And then as you saw, as the weeks went on, people, you know, went from denying it outright to being like, okay, well, it, it's there, but we don't have to move on it that quickly to, okay, now it's really serious and here we go. And, and in a similar way, as we've seen, you know, with, with the climate crisis, and, you know, decades ago, oh, the thing's not happening. Okay, well, it's there, but there's nothing we can do about it. And it's not our fault. 
okay, now it is our fault. We can take something, but maybe it's in the future we've got to deal with it. And now we've really got to deal with it. Um, and, and so not only have we seen that from our political leaders, but it kind of as individuals, I think we've come to terms on it on a similar story arc as well. And so this also gives me hope because this feels like it's a bit of a trial run. And the fact that a disaster that the pandemic is of this magnitude that um, really is the first time in a in hundred years that pretty much everybody on the planet has experienced the same disaster at the same time. Um, what this is doing is, is showing us that we can step up, that we can kind of adapt our behaviors um, and that we're going to be in a, and that we can, um, you know, if, when we start having these, these greater symptoms of climate change, you know, in, intense flooding and, and uh, fires and, and hurricanes and, and everything and freezes and, and, and heat waves that we are going to know what to do. We're going to, we're going to be able to, we, we will have seen what, what it feels like to, to go through a disaster together. And then we will be able to adapt and, and work faster to be able to support each other when those larger symptoms of climate change come. And so that's just something that I've really been sitting with a lot lately. Um, and um, when we think about just kind of health in general, um, like from a, a holistic uh, perspective, it, it really is um, going to, I guess, I just, I, I guess what, I'm, what I'm thinking of is that, you know, this, we're going to be facing some really intense crises. We're already starting to feel it and it's getting more and more intense all the time. And there's going to be a lot of harm and a lot of suffering. There already, we're already, there already is, and there's going to be a lot more. And so uh, it's going to be up to all of us to play a part in reducing that suffering in some way, um, to be partic participating in, in, in harm reduction. And that's what I really see as, as mutual aid, um, stepping up and, and being one of the aspects, one of the, the ways to, to reduce harm. Um, and so as much as we can kind of learn from um, the last few months and kind of carry the, these, these lessons forward in the next few months. Um, it's going to be how we kind of use this opportunity to create these initiatives, to build them up, um, to then be able to have them on the ready to continue serving our communities moving forward once the pandemic has ended. Um, and so I think with that, I want to kind of leave it and um, and really enter into a, a Q and A because you know there's so many people we, we were really happy and uh, I was I was so happy for for Sue to 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 ask me to come and and help do this presentation and this is a, about the third one on different topics that I've been able to do with with Sue over the last couple of years in the Public Health Institute. Um, but one of the reasons why I was really excited to to do this today with with this group and in, in, in particular with with the Public Health Institute's network is because there's so many people that really are involved in their communities already. Um, and so, you know, we've had a, um, a pretty robust chat going already. And as people um, kind of joined, what our, our question really was, was to ask people um, kind of not only to introduce themselves, and if you haven't done that yet, uh, please do in the chat, but also just to, to write into the chat any different um, activities that you have been involved in or that you've seen in your community um, that you feel like really should be replicated or that we can learn from. Um, and so um, just using kind of some of the ideas that have been put into the chat so far, um, I would like to open it up um, to anybody who's on to unmute themselves and feel free to, to ask a question or to, um, to share something that you're, you're doing or that you've seen. I'll start, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Elizabeth. I'm actually one of the editors at Shareable. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I thought was so interesting uh, in terms of community and mutual aid, the uh, school district here has continued to provide free lunch for students, even when they're not physically in school. So there's been a concerted effort to have parents be able to pick up lunches and meals, breakfast and lunch actually, for their children because that's a service that is currently provided. Um, and so the, the 
parent network and community kind of really rallied around that to continue to provide, um, you know, something that many people wouldn't necessarily think about. And I just want to highlight, you know, while while people are thinking about questions or want to um, share anything, um, you know, just looking at some of these from the chat, um, you know, uh, Deborah in in Oklahoma um, with the Department of Human Services, you know, they one of the just the early things that they were involved in was was shifting a 6,500 person workforce to to remote work um, and being able to, to to work with all their customers. Um, and of course, you know this is what you know everybody had to had to go through in, in one way or another. And one of the uh, stories that we've been tracking throughout this year, and again, I, I you know it's it's really got me to start thinking about things in a framework of harm reduction, um, is that we've been working with um, with service providers that are working with people who use drugs, and. Um, you know, that's been, an inc from what we've been learning, is that that's been a pretty incredible shift for um, those service providers, you know, that oftentimes have resource centers, they've had to close their doors, um, the ways that they are now interacting with their service participants um, has completely changed because it so much involves field work, um, you know, with high risk populations. And, um, and so, there's been just so many different le levels of you know what remote work looks like. You know, it's not all just sitting in front of a com of a computer, but oftentimes it's actually for for people that are on the front lines, um, has they've had to do incredible shifts um, to you know maintain health and safety and everything else while still providing vital services. Um, you know, and and harm reduction being one of them. And uh, I'm wondering. Uh, Deanna Martinez in Long Beach, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to jump on and just kind of talk a little bit about some of the, the mutual aid work that you've been doing down in Long Beach. Good morning. My name is Diana Martinez. I'm with Long Beach Forward um, here in Long Beach, California. Um, pretty much ever since the pandemic back in March um, hit us, we started a mutual aid with uh, a coalition of other or local organizations. And we've been working out of our parking lot, um, you know, because of COVID, we're trying to make this as safe as possible. Um, we wanna take care of the community, but you know, we also wanna take care of ourselves and make it as safe as possible. And we make, you know, um, a little like, I guess, chain and like we, um, we, do groceries and do drop-offs for families that need, you know, groceries. We also put informational resources in um, a variety of languages just to make sure that it's as accessible as possible. So it's been honestly so great to be able to do something like that safely and still connect with our community, even if it's from a distance. Thanks, and and I'm wondering, um, were there other examples of mutual aid, you know, networks and and projects that you were inspired by or or adapted or learned from? Um, I'm not sure. I think um, the the um, organizations that we've already that are involved with us in this have already done something similar before the pandemic. It just wasn't as often. Um, and once the pandemic hit, we we all thought that it would be smart to do this weekly instead of, you know, monthly or however so often. So, yeah. And can you just talk a little bit about the different organizations, like what the kind of coalition looks like, like who the organizations are? I don't have a list with me okay. right now. I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's about four other organizations, though, and they're all community like oriented. So it's it's been great to have them. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, I can. Um, yeah. Can you guys hear me? This is Jennifer Paul. Yeah. 
I was just, um, I'm working for uh, the city of Long Beach, actually, the Department of Health and Human Services. There's a few of us, a couple others, at least on the call here from the city of Long Beach. Um, I was just going to say, just kind of tap, you know, uh, carrying off of what she'd said, there are a lot of community agencies that have come, come through to really help Long Beach. And working at the health department, I've been, um, I started out as a, a library social work intern. Um, that was cut short, actually, um, in March. And so I shifted to kind of pandemic response. Um, I graduated in March, and since then I've worked um, first with Cynthia Howell, who's on the line um, through our older adult resource line. Now we've expanded that to be just a general resource line for the city, and so people can call the line in, and essentially we're going to refer them out to many of our amazing partner organizations in the cities to help them out with, you know, anything from rental assistance to, you know, if they need to isolate and quarantine, food support, mental health support, all sorts of things. Um, it's been a real patchwork of collective effort and a lot of people, I think, on the ground that are just kind of communicating with each other and word of mouth, new opportunities coming up. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to just to add to that because um, Long Beach Forward has been a great organization in Long Beach. Um, Cynthia, I think, used to work for them too. And, um, you know, it's been amazing just to see everyone kind of work together around this. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. I think Stephanie, mm -hmm. um, Stephanie what, uh, had a comment that she wanted to share. This is true. Thanks, Sue. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation today. Um, it's really cool to hear all of these examples. One of the things that I'm wondering about is kind of coordination across levels. So thinking about, you know, in, in my individual condo building that I live in, we do a lot of great things. In the city of Denver where I live, we do a lot of great things. In the county of Denver, we do a lot of great things. In Colorado, in the US, globally. And so I'm wondering what kind of, or have you seen any kind of cross scale coordination and alignment of these efforts when it comes to spreading and scaling some of these great ideas. Um, so I'm just, any, any examples, ideas? I, I'm just curious to see what you've seen in that area. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, a great example. It's actually the mutual aid networks <clears throat> out of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, they kind of, and I'll, I, we can put a, a chat in there in a second, excuse me. Um, They've been, really been working um, for many, I think it's about five, six years now to grow uh, mutual aid networks around the U.S. and to kind of network them all together. Um, not only actually in the, U in the U.S., but also internationally in, in Australia, New Zealand, you know, in, in Europe um, and, and many other places. And they have, they kind of, they were built at, originally, they came out of the time banking world. Um, and uh, this is in specifically the time bank in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And they were interested in, in how to kind of integrate uh, a lot of other services in the community into the time bank and kind of build a, a, a local mutual aid network. Um, and then they took that, that model and they've been working with groups uh, you know, in different cities and, and regions to be able to build that out and connect it. There's an annual conference um, you know, and, and trainings and everything else like that. And, and so Stephanie Rierick uh, is, is who's the lead at mutual aid networks. Um, and would highly recommend checking out their work. They've got a lot of great templates and, and different events and websites and you know different ways of, of bringing people together. Um, but you know we've also seen some st things on the on the, uh, on the national level. You know we saw um, AOC get involved with we got our block and you know other politicians kind of jump in and, and help to kind of grow some of these. Um, what were local local initiatives initially in 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 this case in New York um, to be replicated in different places, um, but there hasn't been like a you know besides mutual aid networks there hasn't been like one big umbrella um, pulling together. I mean there's definitely um, RIPUS is the International Network of Solidarity Economy um, groups, and so they kind of uh, there was a lot of overlap between mutual aid and solidarity economy. Um, and so that's kind of where the kind of global organization is happening. And I can put that in the, in the chat in a moment as well. Um, and so that's another place to look. So there is, there is definitely um, uh, kind of national and international collaboration um, that's happening and, and people trying to you know, really build on these things and, and build 
you know, create more um, kind of sustained initiatives that can really aid systemic change. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. And were you talking, did you, had you posted, uh, Stephanie, about some things that you were getting involved with as well? I did, but in, in the very local level. So I um, yeah. saw um, Joshua actually knows about some more cool stuff in my area than I do. And so I've already benefited from being on this um, on this call and just learning about what other people are doing. But I've, I've really very much been, you know, like through work and in my, you know, I, I mentioned I live in a condo building. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a lot of cool things in like my little community, but I haven't, I'm not involved in any, anything in Denver right now. But I'm excited to learn. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Jennifer and I'm a disaster case manager actually in for the Boys and Girls Club of the North Valley here in Chico, California. And as you had mentioned before, um, we were dramatically, um, Chico was dramatically impacted by the, um, oh, sorry, I'm getting a call just a second. Um, by the campfire that happened in Paradise, which is our neighboring town two years ago. And then, um, you know, a lot of our families have still been displaced and um, had, you know, food insecurity already. And then COVID happened. And um, the Boys and Girls Club was amazing. They um, instantly responded by starting to do um, meals every evening, box meals for families to come drive through and pick up a meal for their kids. Um, they made like um, I spy kits for the kids, little um, art art kits to send home with them. The staff like went around and dropped them off um, for families. Um, my son in the background picked them up from school. <laughs> um, and then we also um, did some virtual mentoring because there were a lot of kids that they weren't getting the interaction and engagement that they're missing out, um, not doing in-person school. And so um, it was really amazing to see how the Boys and Girls Club came together to help our families and our community during COVID and um, trying to recover from the fires. And then in August, we had a lightning complex fires that had sparked several fi more fires within our area that it just um, drastically impacted the whole county. And so, um, a lot of the families are still experiencing food insecurity, but we have a North Valley Community Foundation here that they're um, constantly um, getting grants and helping distribute them to organizations and agencies that can help give direct support to families, um, which has been really helpful and beneficial. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to share a little bit of what we've done out here in Butte County to help our families that have been impacted not just by COVID, but by, you know, natural disasters as well. And I appreciate your presentation today and um, everybody else's input. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And, you know, we, uh, I mean, this is a great example of, of the, the layering of disasters, you know, and, and, you know, this has now been happening. You know, we often just have to face one crisis at a time you know, in a single location, you think, okay, we've got a fire. Okay, now we're going to deal with that fire. Or there's an earthquake, we're going to deal with that that earthquake. Or there's a flood, we're going to deal with that flood. And it's got all different kind of externalities and other things that that, that it exposes. Um, you know, the, the systemic issues that were under the surface already, um, that that are really then, um, you know, that are kind of lifted. The veil is lifted. Um, that you know of those inequalities and everything else that was already existing. Um, but it's you know that typically one one acute. Uh, issue and now we're seeing you know the two with the pandemic and that and and um, you know there's you know in California you know we're we we this this summer has just been so intense you know with the amount of fires and again fires burning in the same place where there was fires before um, you know communities that are just just barely recovering just being hit once again uh, it's it's not something that we're used to to facing. Um, and, and so I know definitely in, in the Chico area, this has been, this has been really big. And, and we, 
we actually, uh, I was mentioning the, the 30 minute audio documentary we did about Chico early in the, in the beginning of the pandemic. We did another uh, audio documentary um, last year uh, about the Paradise Fire and, and how, and, and that community and, and kind of some of the lessons that came through it and, and how, you know, kind of how we can reimagine our communities moving forward out of disasters. Um, and, and so, you know, that kind of definitely led into why we went back to Chico when we, when it became time for the pandemic, because we were interested in, in what that, that rippling effect was going to be. Um, and another place where we've seen that rippling effect specifically in California, um, is over in, in another part of, of the state with Sonoma County. It's not that far away, um, which also had had a, a huge fire, you know, back in 2017. And again, fires in the, around the same area, uh, in, in Napa this year. And uh, one of the most impacted communities was the undocumented community. And, and, and so uh, there was a really great example um, that was, or initiative that was created called UndocuFund specifically to support that uh, undocumented folks back in, in 2017. Um, and they have reopened the fund and, and continue to support people during the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're having to, to be, uh, it's, it's definitely just, yeah, it's, it's reduced the effectiveness, it's made everything harder um, to then address these, these disasters moving forward. I know in, in my community, I'm, I'm, I'm from the small village and I've recently moved back to it and it's a super, super high fire danger area in the East Bay Hills, uh, you know, around San Francisco. And, um, you know, one of the things that we've done the last few years is that we, uh, in the, the winter and spring, every single weekend, or rather one weekend per month, we will have a... Um, kind of a, a larger, uh, a big work day, basically, to um, get uh, uh, people to all come together and, and reduce brush and, and that sort of thing. And so we haven't had um, the ability to do that. And so now when, when fire danger, fire season came along, um, we really have uh, had... Uh, a lot more anxiety and fear and, and haven't been able to get out in front of, of that. Unfortunately, we didn't have any fires. We had huge lightning come through and it was, you know, fires got started around our community, but not within it. Um, and, and so a lot of, of things have become a lot more precarious um, as a result. So, so yeah, those layering disasters, same thing has happened, you know, with, again, with, with a record hurricane season, uh, you know, earthquakes in, in, in many different places, record flooding, and just the ability to be able to come out and, and do that initial response has been incredibly hindered. Um, so we just have about five, five more minutes and just want to make sure that if there's anybody else who wants to just to, to say something or to share something they've been uh, involved in, um, want to just make sure we open up the field and give you an opportunity. I wanted to chime in. There was a comment in the chat about uh, remote school resources. Yeah. Um, we do have a piece in the ebook on remote school. We've seen people come together to create virtual co-ops. We've seen sharing of tutors um, and parents' work schedules as well as some people converting um, former you know, community spaces that they weren't able to use in the same way anymore due to social restrictions um, be repurposed. And we also have seen um, communities come together to provide free internet. So obviously access to internet and availability in communities where that is very difficult. Um, we have written stories about you know how people have pushed um, their providers and even in some cases um, build their own wi-fi uh, strung together networks which they've done you know we've, we've documented how to do that in our how-to guides as well so there are ways you can string together you know your and pool your resources when it comes to the virtual schooling as well and i mean and it's been yeah, thanks for asking and thanks for, uh, for, for adding that in, Elizabeth. I mean, and, and the, the virtual school, thing, I mean, even, even the, you know, for, for every, every solution, you know, it sometimes opens up additional, additional problems that are still being navigated. I mean, even with, um, you know, pods and, and kind of learning pods uh, have been really, really important for, for students to be able to come together and, and still um, be with other kids. But at the same time, they're, they are, uh, 
the pods are exclusive in nature. And, and so I know of a lot of parents that have struggled with feeling like their, their child were, you know, were being ostracized because they weren't invited to a pod or, you know, they were closed off. And, and, and so there's, even that can be exclusive. And so there's, there's a need to kind of break down those barriers. There's a lot of schools that are helping to facilitate those pods. And I think that's really important. Um, and uh, PTAs and, and things like that that are, are participating and helping to facilitate those pods. Um, you know, one of the, the, the things that's really important about a classroom is that there are, there's a, a diversity of, of learning abilities and learning styles. And, um, and so when uh, pods are, are created um, without complete intentionality to be able to facilitate that, um, then you know that that kind of diversity and learning styles and, and bringing kids together again, you know, people that that have certain disabilities get will more likely get left behind. Um, so it still re requires a lot of a lot of thinking and a lot of care, um, or else it can continue to do potentially even more harm. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, once again, you know, want to just thank everyone for coming and engaging in the conversation. Um, you know, we, we mentioned before that we have, uh, you know, the book, which we put it, we put the link to, um, please, please download it, please, you know, free, feel free to share it. Again, this is just our first launch. We just only just published it at, at 8 a.m. this morning. So, um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a freshie. Um, so thanks for doing that. And then also, you know, just wanted to encourage people, um, if you're interested in hearing more stories and, and again, this, this year, um, we pivoted a lot of our work at Shareable um, to focus on uh, kind of the ways that communities were responding to the, the pandemic. And we've also done that with our, our podcast series, The Response. And so I, I mentioned a couple of the audio documentaries we've produced, um, but we've produced a lot, of, a, a lot of different episodes. We're having ongoing conversations that we're, we're documenting. Um, some, of, some of them have kind of worked their way into the book as well. Um, but we are regularly, pu pu regularly pulling together um, roundtables and, and all sorts of things. Um, and, and if you're looking for a way to kind of bring together your community virtually, you know, other neighbors to build out some sort of a mutual aid network, or you want to kind of strengthen it and, and look for other ideas, um, we have a, our, our film that I mentioned earlier, which is about Puerto Rico and their mutual aid work um, that, have, that has come after the hurricanes there. Um, and if you go onto our website, and again, we just put the link in there for the response, um, you can sign up to host a free screening um, for friends or family or anything else like that. And it's just a really great tool to convene uh, people together to then have conversations about what you might want to create in your own communities. Um, and so that's the response, how Puerto Ricans are restoring power to the people. It's the name of that, um, that our award-winning film. Um, so with that, I will say, you know, just thank you again. And um, just also want to include people, if you feel like you um, want to follow up with us at Shareable, um, please do. You can always contact us at info at shareable.net. And, um, and, you know, please stay, uh, check out our website for, for more stories like this and, and discussions and opportunities to engage. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, and thank you, Sue and, and Public Health Institute for, for co-hosting this conversation.